the purpose of Wealth Talk is to educate, inform, and hopefully entertain you on the subject of building your wealth. Wealth Builders recommends you should always take independent financial, tax, or legal advice before making any decisions around your finances. Welcome to episode 128 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, and I'm joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Chris, and good to be with you on camera. I think we've got some very interesting things to share today. I think I'm going to get on my soapbox a bit today. Oh, okay. Well, we always enjoy having that kind of discussion. I guess it's following on from your uh, your trip to the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago, Kevin, and uh, we're going to bust a few uh, misconceptions, a few myths around pensions today. Yeah, I think we have to. Um, look, it was really fascinating being at the House of Lords, and, uh, and and it was really interesting as well that the subject that was being raised was pensions. And um, what, what's very interesting from the ex-pensions minister, Baroness Altman, a very learned lady, I have to say, and, um, you know, she's quoted in the press as saying, look, you know, people are just so disconnected. It's time to get connected to pensions. Um, almost, you know, we need a pension to be proud of. That, that, that there's no positive emotion associated with pension. It's all negative. And I think there's good reason. And, and, and for that reason, our youngsters, very passionate about young people, aren't we, Chris? And hence the Wealth Builders for Families program coming out soon. And uh, one of the myths that's going to be perpetuated almost by accident, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very tragic about the outcome for that, is our young people will switch off from their pensions. Um, they'll switch off because they'll have student debt. They'll switch off because the language is complicated. They'll switch off because there's no sense of connecting to their life. And so if the only consequence is what you need to say when you're old, well, sure you do. I mean, the macro picture for that, the big economic picture, has been changing for decades. And it's a ticking time bomb. I mean, we can see that. Just look at what's happening now. I mean, the the age of being able to open your pension was is moving from 55 to 57 in 2028, so just around the corner in, in economic terms. Uh, we're seeing the lifetime allowance the most money you can put into your pension before you start getting uh, tax charges is starting to get restricted and squeezed. We've got the triple lock, you know, the government pension lock for the sa- safety of our of our old pensioners is, is really all, always under pressure. And, and as a result, I think we're getting poorer and poorer when it comes to our pensions. And, and actually, I think pensions are fundamentally broken. I really do, Chris. I think the whole concept behind pensions is flawed. Um, Historically, we've had the final salary pension. And the final salary pension is just really now the domain of the public sector, the armed forces, the, you know, my son-in-law who's a fireman, uh, you know, people in that sort of industry. And, And fair play, you know, that's a government pot. And there's no money to back that up. It's future taxpayers who are paying. But when you think about that, that's a good benefit to have for two reasons. The first reason is it's it's an automatic income linked to your salary. So, so you don't have the risk of trying to manage the process. So you can just do the work and build up your years of contribution. However, you need to put in 40 years just to get two thirds out. Well, I don't think our wealth building plan is predicated on dropping your income by a third and waiting 40 years to get it. I mean, I think that's flawed. But the other thing is, and and, and that's just very dangerous for people uh, to think about if they don't know, is the pension often dies with the person who built it. In other words, usually there's 50% transferred to a spouse. So if someone's got a 40 grand pension, 20,000 is going to go to a spouse. Now, all of a sudden, the spouse or partner is now going to live on significantly less without having necessarily the knowledge because they assumed they were being taken care of. 
And then the children essentially become disinherited because on the death of the spouse, the money goes. Um, you know, so so there's no value in the family. And I just think this is flawed. And if people don't realize that, families in the next generation, rather than being empowered and wealth being created for them and then them being included in the thinking and building wisdom, as we know, is so important in, in building wealth for families, that's all lost. And that's tragic. And that's the best you're going to get. That's the best in this country, you know? So yeah. it's, a, it's a real big issue for me. And, and I think the, the huge transfer of risk from the employer or the public sector to the individual. In other words, all of the risk now, pretty much all the big companies, transfer the risk of managing retirement planning to the individual. But the individual doesn't take that responsibility. Mm. They delegate it to a third party in a one day, someday, I hope everything works out. And of course, we know single point of failure, having all your eggs in a stock market basket, when the stock market is volatile, when it's, you think about what we do in Wealth Builders, we try and encourage people to think of their security. We try and get them to think about owning assets so they own something that's secure. When you've got a traditional pension, we're just rising and falling on the whims of a market over which you've got zero control. And you, and you think that somehow that's secure. It's fundamentally unsecure. And how the hell then, when you get older, are you supposed to manage drawing a secure, steady flow of income from an asset that itself is fundamentally insecure? You can't do it. So you live a life almost continually in worry, in doubt, in fear. And that's what's happening to our current pensioners. And that's why so many of them are stacking shelves and serving you in Sainsbury's and other good supermarkets in their 70s because they simply haven't got enough money and they're worried about making ends meet. Yeah. The tragic shift of the responsibility to the individual who have got no knowledge and no ability to be able to manage that responsibility is a complete shocker. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm right just, off. I'm but just gripping I'm, onto that soapbox. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to get back on it. I'm going to get back on it in a minute. Well, we I'll let you about the financial services industry who profit handsomely from all of this opaqueness and all of this um, apparent, you know, uh, transfer of that, and they profit so handsomely from it that I think it's a crime. Oh, let me let you pause for a second there, because uh, that's a good, it's a, you know, great points that you made there, Kevin. And it's the reason why we felt it was important, again, to bring this topic uh, to the forefront. And we talk about pensions a lot at Wealth Builders, but of course, if we just zoom out for regular listeners who know all about the Wealth Builders principles of building wealth across multiple pillars, and we've got seven yeah. pillars of wealth, and pensions is pillar number two. But again, for anyone perhaps doesn't you know, realize the distinction of those seven pillars is that the first three, which is home capacity, pensions, and investments, are what we call the traditional pillars. And, you know, most people in the UK are relying on a pension. And, you know, there's, there's millions, if not trillions of pounds worth in, in the pension industry, you know, and then that's just the UK. And of course, we're looking worldwide here. So, you know, so many people are still relying on their pensions. But as we know, so many people are just completely oblivious to actually the current state of their pension. They don't really know what's in there. They don't really check it. And today's episode mm -hmm. is really about being proactive, being accountable, taking control, which, again, are all the principles of, of a good wealth builder. Oh, absolutely. And thanks thanks for the pause there. And definitely it's it's important because when you think about the traditional pillars, the ones most people have, a home they live in, which invariably doesn't turn into income because they live in their home, right? So we know there are people making income from their home, but most people don't. Uh, they have a pension, they have some money either in cash or in the stock market. Well, fundamentally, what we're saying is they're, they're relying on their wealth to come from a source over which they have no control. So they can't control the interest rate. So cash is not what well, we know as we speak today. It's not a really great earner, is it, having money in cash? 
um, and the stock market is so insecure and it's so heavily charged. I don't mean charged as in powered and ready to go, but charged as in the the cost of managing money in the UK has not followed the change and an increase of, of the benefits of technology. And I think the traditional industry, um, and I have a go as, as an IFA myself, you know, who's someone who, not quite a poacher turned gamekeeper, but somebody who fundamentally realized this lesson in 2008, when with good intentions, trying to do my best by clients as an IFA, I realized I wasn't serving them. I simply couldn't because I couldn't keep anybody safe. And while you can reduce fees and, and do your best to manage fees for people, fundamentally, you know, you, you're getting attacked at both ends. One is you can't control the returns and you need to know what the returns are to be able to know what your income is going to come. So let's think about that. If, if you've got a stock market that long-term, um, and different economists will, will agree or disagree, but we'll pick a number, um, for an average, someone who doesn't take very much interest in their pension, they'll, they'll normally do some form of a risk questionnaire. You know, what, what's your attitude to risk? And most people will come out in the middle, right? That's just the way it is. And um, so the average return they'll get long-term, uh, taking into account the, the way people invest money, which is they just invest and hold. You know, they just hold on for the long-term. And they're encouraged to do that. And I think that's fundamentally flawed as well. I'll come back to that if I get a chance to do that. But when you fundamentally then just let your money ride and you get the booms and the bumps and you get the, the challenges that we saw in 2008, I just mentioned, you're, you're going to get an average net return of around 6%, say. And from that income, and if you imagine then that 6%, we know there's fees in managing money. Of course there are fees. I'm not saying it should be a fearless society. That's crazy. But the fees are too high. And on average people in the UK are paying 2% for their money to be managed. And there's a there's a, a misgiving on my part here that people think somehow, uh, number one, it sounds like a small amount of money. It's only 2%. Well, actually, it's not. 2% is a percentage of 6, 33%. So you're giving a third of your money away. But then the compounding effect of that third means you're getting less and less and less because more of the return you could have got, you're not getting, which means it's harder to get the income to build the capital pot because the, the principle is accumulation over cash flow. All right, let me say that again. If you try and build a pension based on, I want to get to a certain point, and then when I get to that certain point, I stop and then live off the interest or the returns, you're always going to be on a hiding to nothing because you've got to hope that timing works out. You're generating no cash flow along the way. You're just rolling with the tide. And then when you get to retirement, when you get older, probably your attitude to risk shifts, and it should, and means you take less risk. So if you take less risk, you're going to get a lower return. If you're still paying the same fees, you're going to earn even less. And then let's say you, most, most economists would, would say, I don't agree with it, but let's say most economists would say that in retirement, most people can draw, say, 4% from their pension. And that would give them a reasonable chance of that money lasting for them. Well, that's a big risk because if you if you imagine you retired in 2008 and you got hammered the day you retired, you'll never recover from that. You will never, ever recover from that. So you've got to hope that the timing works. But if it does work, you're then dropping your income from, let's say it was six to four. That's a third you've dropped and you're still paying fees. Uh, and then the chances then, you know, just think about the amount of money you need. If you're getting a 4% return, assuming you even are, 
you need 25 times the income. Now, most of our uh, members, Chris, say we want £10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. right? Well, even if we rounded that down, it says a hundred grand a year. Multiply 100 by 25. You need 2.5 million in your pension pot. The average pension pot in the UK is less than 100 grand. It's not going to happen. It simply will not happen. And what, what gets me more than anything else is the fees remain high and the encouragement of the industry is to go with that accumulation model. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. So we encourage at WealthBuild is the opposite of the accumulation model. It's the cash flow model. You build assets to create cash flow. Now, if you get solid multiple streams of cash flow, then you've got more predictability, not just because you're not relying on one asset, but you're getting multiple assets. But in addition to that, you've got streams of money that's flowing already. So it's not subject to value because the cash flow is flowing from the ownership of the asset. The other thing, of course, is the stock market is fundamentally unsecure. It's not secure. You know, it's not like if you own a piece of property, you've got the security of ownership of property. What do you own in a pension fund? You own a share of the stock market, which rises and falls, and you have got absolutely no security at all. That, that share or that equity, whatever you hold, can go bust. We've seen that happen. You know, we've seen the demise of equitable life. We've seen uh, companies go bust and we've seen shares go bust. You've got no security. People think it's secure because, you know, somebody's managing their money for them, but it's they're not managing money. They're, it's really just parking money for you and then charging you a high premium for the privilege of having done that. It's like somebody sells you a car and then plugs a siphon into your life for the rest of your life because they sold you the car. It's basically salesmanship. It's not management. And you cannot delegate your way, your way to wealth. And uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to pause on that soapbox and say, do not delegate. Because if you delegate, it very quickly turns into abdication. And abdication means you're hoping and you're hoping instead of planning. And there's definitely no way to build wealth by hoping that one day everything will work out for you because chances are it won't. And then you can't teach your kids anything just to hope. You need to build wisdom so you can pass on this to the next generation. And uh, But more importantly, secure your wealth for yourself so you never have an unsecure retirement. And in, in any event, who, who wants to retire? I mean, if you love what you're doing and you enjoy your wealth building, why would you want to retire? You just enjoy what you're doing. The whole concept of retirement is a fundamental notion I disagree with. It, it's almost like we're all put out to pasture when we get old. Well, I'd have been pastured off years ago, wouldn't I? So crazy, crazy thoughts going on, Chris. Okay, so that seems like a good moment for us just to take a break there, Kevin. I do want to pick up on the point you made, obviously, about your view of long-term investing in the market and why perhaps that is a, a flawed method. Um, but uh, let's have a look at the latest reviews on Trustpilot, because we love to give shout outs to those that have taken time to write us a review. And uh, one in over the last seven days from Mr. Cox, who says, I had followed Kevin for a number of years before deciding to jump on board with Wealth Builders. Yes, Kevin and his extended team are truly knowledgeable and always on hand to help, but the service they offer is so much more than that. What has struck me is Kevin's personal touch. I ran into a problem which it could have been argued was outside the scope of what I had signed up to. Kevin, without any fuss, jumped on a call. I'm so grateful to have been able to utilize you as much needed sounding board that day, Kevin. You boosted my confidence enormously. And rather than making me feel stupid over what had happened, thank you. Well, that's nice. I mean, it's the touch of humility from... From Mr. Cox there, um, you know, we, we like him, obviously, and uh, respect him and appreciate the, the kind comment. And uh, I think, you know, we're not, we're not doing that for any plaudits. It was because he reached out and said, look, I, I need some help. Can you help me? And, you know, we don't turn down that uh, for our members or, or anybody, really. 
No, and can't um, forget um, Mrs. Cox yeah. as well there, of course. Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, <laughs> we have that. a joke on our monthly uh, Q&As, yeah, don't we? Really. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you for that uh, lovely review. And for everyone else, you know, we obviously only got time to read uh, one or two out each week. But uh, we really do appreciate you taking time and letting us know that you've just, you know, found value and found help and guidance and support and all the words that come up really often about the community. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate that. So thank you. And mm-hmm. um, so I think it'd be good for us to, to perhaps in this second half, Kevin, talk about, well, what can people do, right? So most people are perhaps just blindly going through life without really taking any stock of, of what's going on in their pension. And, you know, some might get lucky and it works out okay. Majority of people, probably not. And of course, all of our members know that there's a real strong focus, you know, at the beginning of working with us, certainly in the academy, one of the early, um, you know, exercises is what we call debits. And it's really taking stock and reviewing, certainly looking at those costs and seeing if they can be reduced. And, And just that alone can make such a big difference. Yeah, certainly as far as pensions are concerned, look, we, I think the whole process of debits is really a stock take. Um, and when you've got a stock take, it means take stock, find out, get information, gather information. Uh, and that means you've got to be committed to want to do that. So if you're gathering information, it means you know, look at your look at your pension history, look at where you've been, where you've worked. Uh, so you've got an opportunity to, if you've got your national insurance number, and you can have a look at where you used to work. There's probably some money there. I mean, we've got lots of examples of finding money for people or helping people discover money they they didn't realise they had or forgotten or lost or just got disconnected. And and apparently, you know, we've written an article on this before, Chris, is like £10 billion, pounds, billion. You know, we're not talking about uh, small potatoes here. We're talking about £10 billion of pension money floating in the ether. Uh, well, actually, technically, it's not floating because guess who's getting profit from it. Um, and it's not the members, it's not the people who own the money, it's the in- industry um, that that basically is keeping the profit. And, and if the money never gets repatriated, it gets kept. So, you know, we want that money to go back to the real and genuine owners of that money. So number one, take stock. Number two, find out what are you paying in fees? You know, there's a plethora of fees. Fund manager charges, advisory charges, uh, custodian charges, transactional charges, something we call the total expense ratio or TER. Just find out whoever's managing the money. Um, Maybe they won't be managing it for much longer, but they're managing it now. What's my TER? What am I paying? And then do the maths. Have a look at it and go, well, hang on a minute. You know, and if you're paying very small amounts of money, which should be somewhere in the region of 0.2, 0.3, maybe maximum 0.5, you know, half a percent, significantly lower than two. If it's lower than one, it's not too bad. If it's more than one, it's too high. And if it's more than one and a half, it's way, way, way too high. And in any event, you know, that's just doing one thing. That's just finding out your fees. And we can show you the impact of those fees that will be taking money from you in the long term, taking money from your income because it's money you won't be able to spend and taking money from your legacy. You know, it's, you, you get you get whacked three times. You know, it's just a real problem here. You're losing money from your retirement nest egg. You That means you've got less money to spend to generate income, which means you've got less money to leave if you care about leaving a legacy. And all of those things are quite fundamental which is why we like people to take stock. It's boring, it's routine, it's, but it's, it needs to be done. And I encourage everybody to do that. And we have a team of people who can help if people um, are willing to get it done, but don't know where to start or don't know how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, once you've got hold of those statements, you've reviewed those costs, if you're not kind of sure what to do next and you just want to have a chat, exactly. then reach yeah. out to us and, uh, you know, you can just email hello at wealthbuilders.co.uk. That's probably the easiest and quickest way to get in touch with us and we we'll, can assist you. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's really, really important. And if you think you've lost it altogether, there's a tracing agency in uh, Newcastle um, that can help you find you know, companies go bust, but the pensions are still protected. Companies merge, you know, things like that. Um, often we found there's a big 
disparity also, Chris, with um, for women. You know, so if they sometimes they'll change their name, but lose track of their maiden name and their pension. Uh, they might take some time to raise a family, for example. I know it can work the other way around as well, but you know, typically it's not uncommon for um, a female to take time and lose connection to the pensions, you know, while they're raising a family and go back to work later for a different company or in a different way. Um, and uh, that pension gets lost. So, so look, these are the things you can do to find out what you've got as a stock take. But let me give you some tips, Chris, because my big worry in traditional pillars of pensions investments is an over-reliance on the stock market and too much payment and fees. Now, I've done the fees to death a bit now, so I'm going to talk about risk. Rolling with the spin of the wheel and how the market, just hoping that, you know, watching and waiting is not a plan. It's just, you're just being blown about. There are risk mitigation techniques, things you can do to reduce, mitigate, and in some cases, eliminate risk. Uh, you can't eliminate it permanently because there's always some risk in anything you do. Just getting up out of bed is a risk. But you can reduce risk. And one of those things is to, uh, we've said that, this before, Chris, we call it the the gold technique, you know, which is you pay attention to what's happening. And we're speaking now at a time when we've had a considerable period of time in um, in a bull market. Markets are going up. And, and if you've made some gains, then that's the G, G for gains. Identify that and go, well, you know, I've looked at my statement. I had 100,000. It's now 180 crumbs. I've done well. Well, don't just roll on red and hope it comes out okay. Take some of those gains, whatever you think is right, and we can talk about that if people get in touch, but bank some of those gains. So you identify the gain, I've made 80 grand. Take some of those gains off the table. Now, what does off the table mean? It means you say, well, look, I've got my money invested in this particular strategy. I'm now having to learn a new strategy. And then I take some of those gains off the table, mean out of that current strategy, just rolling with the market. And then I lock in those gains, bank them, garner them, harness them, and diversify into something else. Now, the very act of doing that, gains off the table, lock in, and diversify, is just a simple you know, way that we try and teach this idea. But the best way to, to react to that, the best way to do that is to become more focused on who you are. Think about investing in line with your own personal DNA. Who are you? What are you interested in? What do you like? What could you get interested in? So instead of just delegate, abdicate, hope, hope one day, someday, you say, no, hold on a minute. What am I interested in? Am I interested in environmentally friendly things? Am I interested in sustainable things? Am I interested in green things? Am I interested in recurring income? Am I interested in, you know, what am I interested in? And then invest in some of those things that reflect who you are. And so that you become an investor rather than a delegator. And then by investing, you're taking personal stake in things, personal stock of things, and you're gradually starting to learn more. And then you can learn more pillars. So you could invest in property. You could invest in uh, precious metals. You could invest in cryptocurrency. You could invest in property loan notes. You could invest in a whole raft of things. I'm not saying what people should invest in. We never say what people should invest in. You should invest in line with who you are. And you should be able to choose that. And if you're not sure, then we can try and help you connect with who you are by looking at your wealth dynamics, looking at what other people are doing so you can get inspiration. And then sometimes that inspiration can lead you to get education. And that education leads into curiosity. That leads into you taking action. So the whole process of wealth building is about participating in the program. That means you are... You've got a plan. You're not just hoping for the best. 
Now, with some people listening, Kevin, they might be saying or thinking, okay, well, you know, I've got a workplace pension. I can't choose which funds I'm investing. You know, it's out of my control. So, so we kind of leaning more into different types of pensions. Obviously, a SIP is, is one where you have more control over the funds you invest in. Well, generally speaking, Chris, you know, um, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news again, but two of those points you made are fundamentally not true. So the first thing is with a workplace pension, I understand it's really valuable to get benefits from an employer. I think it's great. if the, and, and of course, it's a legal obligation now. There has to be contributions. Um, so if you're paying 5% and your employer is paying 5%, you're doubling up on your money, and that's great. And you can invest in two different strategies. You could say, I'll invest my money in strategy A and my, my employer's money in strategy B. So you've got two different things to compare and contrast. You could do that. You could, if you wanted to, get to a place where you, um, you look at something called um, a partial transfer. Now, I'm not suggesting people do anything, but you could find out, which is if I wanted to, and I've got, let's use 100,000, what's the minimum amount of money I need to leave in that scheme? Well, let's say it's 5,000 pounds. Okay. So now you've got 95,000. You could completely remove from the workplace pension and put it into another pension if that pension served you better and uh, and it worked for you. And again, that could be um, a different type of pension, or it could be just a different strategy within the same one. Uh, but most employers are not actively helping people to understand these choices because that's not their role, is it? You know, you've got to be responsible for yourself. And we've got many, many hundreds of clients who take their money out of their workplace pensions. They don't lose the benefit, but they use that money elsewhere, whether they create a, a SIP or a SAS. A SIP is a self-invested personal pension. So it's a personal pension with only really one extra dynamic to it, which is commercial property. And commercial property isn't isn't for everyone, um, but that's an option. And the other, of course, which we've spoken about many, many times, for those who are eligible, business owners, not employees, but business owners, then they're eligible for something known as a SAS. And we've, we've talked about SAS probably Many, many times, and, and certainly there's lots of podcasts and, and lots of resources on SaaS, and we know that the SaaS turns a pension into a business and a business owner is taking responsibility and they run their pension like they run their business. And, and I love SaaS for that reason, and it's the very thing that got me kind of changing my pension life myself when I kind of wrestled with this from 2008 and First of all, tried to sip. That didn't work because it was still restrictive. And then discovered SAS and realized the power of that. And now I'm a very enthusiastic advocate of SAS for those who are willing to get involved, willing to learn what it takes to in, in terms of running, um, learning their own investor DNA so they know what they're interested in for themselves. It's not more delegation. And, and those who've got a business and are, are willing to get their hands on their money, and to build a plan that eventually also includes their children so that the whole idea of SAS is a family uh, plan, you know, a YFA, you know, it's your family's assets, not an IFA, like I look after your money. So I'm not advocating or advertising a service for me at all, or wealth builders. In fact, it's really, it's for you to learn how to become much more responsible. And that responsibility comes at a price of, You've got to get involved, but it also comes at a huge, huge benefit, uh, which is if you can create more security because you don't have just one asset, you've got much greater level of security, and then you've got a better return. So you're using your own personal skill to get a higher return. Well, then you don't have to take less risk when you get older. So if you've got a bigger pot, you're banking as you go, you're creating cash flow, you've got that security of cash flow to spend. And then you're bringing in wisdom for the next generation. You're, 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 you're solving the three problems that I mentioned earlier on. You know, challenge with, with just accumulation versus cash flow, uh, just rolling with the risk instead of risk mitigation, and then just hoping for the best, having a plan. Uh, and that's why I think SAS is a very powerful thing. But there's, uh, again, lots of reasons why people would want to maybe get in touch with us on that one. That's 
that's the bit I get more excited about than anything else, I think. Yeah. And uh, again, a reminder for anyone who you know, is curious to find out a bit more about that, we've got plenty of videos inside our free membership area. So just head to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash membership, and you can start watching those and understanding that a little bit more. Um, did we cover off all the points you wanted to make about the long-term investing strategy there, Kevin, that is kind of just riding a wave and you don't really have, well, you don't have any control over that really? Yeah, I think I've covered pretty much everything and, um, you know, more than happy if anybody wants to get in touch with us and solve some of those problems, you know, the removal of the risk from the market to being involved in your risk, reduction in fees, potential improvement in your ROI, your returns, uh, proper risk mitigation techniques, building knowledge so that you can bring the family in at a later date, all of those things are very, very powerful things for a wealth builder. A wealth builders look, think differently. I don't mean a little bit differently. I mean dramatically differently. When you create wealth, you can do so typically in five years, you know, and so if you can do that in five years, you're not having to wait until you're 65 or 17 hoping for the best. Okay. Well, we hope you enjoyed listening to that episode today and and maybe you can think of someone who else who might enjoy that. So please, you know, feel free to share this episode or or any of the other episodes, you know, that you've enjoyed uh, listening to. So uh, Mm -hmm. spread the love. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Kevin. And uh, we'll definitely be catching up same time, same place next week. Mm -hmm. Until then, my friend. See ya. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget that we are constantly updating our resources inside the Wealth Builders membership site to help you create, build and protect your wealth. Head over to wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership right now for free access. That's wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership.